uh, get started. So we'll continue on with our discussion uh, from last time and where, oh yes, oh, Wireshark, that will probably be delayed. I'll let you know uh, through the Slack channel uh, what the status of that is, how easy or hard it's going to be uh, to swap out PCAP. So finding an alternative driver, uh, there's something called AirCap, uh, but uh, if it supports the interfaces that Wireshark assumes uh, above it. So that's the issue. So. All right, so you'll find out about that. So where we left off last time, uh, we talked about hybrid fiber coax. And this was uh, a coaxial cable. And if you have a cable modem, uh, specifically uh, the Xfinity uh, product from Comcast, uh, you see cabling like this inside the house. And as we said before, uh, there are these mysterious green boxes throughout uh, developments and neighborhoods and along streets. And uh, fiber optic strand comes into these boxes called the cable head end. And on the other side of those boxes, what emerges from them are coaxial cable. And and the reason for that certainly is because a uh, fiber optic strand can carry a signal reliably over a very uh, long uh, distance and fiber optic strand is very high bandwidth. Uh, but something like coaxial cable, um, it can't carry as much bandwidth or as much data uh, as, um, as fiber um, and it's, uh, um, you can't carry it over long enough, as long of a distance or as much bandwidth, uh, but the benefit is that it's cheap. Right? Um, it'd be very expensive to have fiber to individual houses. Now, something like Verizon Fios, they do what's called fiber to the curb. The fiber comes up to the individual house. And remembering what happened in history, well, uh, cable uh, was initially just uh, for television. Um, is it all right if I turn these off? Is that better, horse? No? Leave them on? Turn them off? So like that, is that better? All right, or like that? Even better? So on middle or off middle? The smell, okay, all right, off middle, okay, <laughs> all right, I'm hearing more off than on. All right, don't do that, because it's more visible. All right, <laughs> so um, fiber, uh, cable uh, is, coaxial cable is cheaper uh, than fiber, and at the end of the day, they want it to be inexpensive, but fiber to the curb, which is what Verizon Fios has, uh, is a lot more expensive uh, when you're running fiber to individual houses. Uh, first, you have to find some place to put the fiber, right? Uh, it could be on poles, it could be underground. Um, it really likes to be underground, but in many communities with high population density, uh, you put it on telephone poles on the wires, um, among the wires. And so it's called coaxial cable uh, because there are two quote unquote axes uh, of uh, along which the signal uh, travels. In the center of uh, the cable is a conductor, and it's, uh, both conductors are copper. Uh, and uh, on the sh uh, sheath along the outside the insulation, there's a piece, uh, piece of braided copper mesh, and that's the other conductor. And it's called coaxial because these two things share the same axis, um, the axis along which that um, uh, conductor in the center wire um, uh, travels. And so you have these uh, connectors here that you kind of screw on and you have them coming inside your house uh, from the cable box on the side of the house, usually on the outside, sometimes it's on the inside um, and it runs throughout your house as well as comes to the curb from the cable head end to your house. And so we talked about the following setup. We have a service provider and we can see the switching fabric consisting of routers and communication links and they're very high speed and they're usually fiber. And then we have uh, this fiber coming into the cable uh, head end and the cable head end is in some box typically and they're dotted throughout communities, developments along streets. And so emerging from the cable head end are these coaxial cables, whether they're buried or uh, they're on poles uh, running along uh, the wires and the poles. Uh, and there's a tap associated with each one, and there's a line that comes to each house. And on the outside of the house is typically a box, uh, and that box um, is, accepts that coaxial cable, and then uh, that cable comes inside uh, from that box, uh, usually through a filter to try to remove some of the noise uh, from that signal, and then it goes into your cable modem, and then one uh, line goes into your television to give you cable TV. And because cable, uh, coaxial cable, uh, was originally intended for television, and if you think about what happens with television, you have a bunch of channels, right? A channel is nothing more uh, than a range of frequencies or a frequency block that you use to push uh, some sort of signal, and that signal is a particular television program, 
right? So when you listen to, um, you know, ESPN or you listen to CNN or watch CNN or, or CNBC or HGTV or, you know, Oprah Network or what have you, uh, what you're doing is that audiovisual signal uh, for that particular content from that provider, it occurs within some block of frequencies, similar uh, to a radio. If you listen to uh, 105.3, which is, I guess, WDAS, FM uh, from Philadelphia, uh, that 105.3 is uh, the frequency, 105.3 megahertz, uh, and that is the center frequency among the block of frequencies over which that content uh, from that radio broadcaster uh, is propagated. And so you have some channels, and you have many of them because audio visual, especially because of the high def video, is very high bandwidth. And so the idea then was to um, kind of scrunch this information into a more compact block of channels and then free up uh, some bandwidth, some a spectrum, if you will, blocks of channel for uh, transmitting and receiving data. And so that was what cable modem did. Uh, and you'll see uh, something called DOCSIS when you read specifications for cable modem. It's the standard for signaling uh, the communication uh, protocol for getting data to and from uh, the, the cable modem. Now, they've always been able to send some data to your cable modem because even from early on in the history of cable TV uh, in the 80s, uh, they had pay-per-view, right? And what happens in pay-per-view, right? You have a special event, uh, you call up your provider, you say, hello, this is my account number, I'd like to pay the $50 or however much it is uh, to watch this program. And they say, okay, let's look up your account and they turn it on. And so that turning on is basically pushing a code uh, to your cable set top box uh, that allows you to decode this particular channel with that specialized content, right? So they've always been able to transmit data to and from the cable box, but with cable modems, they sort of opened this up to now push data to and fro as it pertains to general internet traffic. Okay, all right, any questions about this? All right, so it's called hybrid fiber coax because you have fiber optic strand um, serving entire cities and you know larger groups of people coming up to the uh, cable head end to deliver that uh, data. And then on the other side of the head end, you have um, a coaxial cable. So hybrid fiber coax uh, refers to the fact that you have two of those different types of physical communication links. Okay, and so it's asymmetric, uh, meaning that the rate at which you can push data downstream, meaning coming from the internet to the homes in that direction inbound is much higher bandwidth than the opposite direction going from the homes to uh, out into uh, the ISP. And of course, the reason for that uh, should seem obvious because if it's originally purposed for television, well, in television, very rarely do you have to send a signal out from your home to the outside world. Most of that data comes downstream to you uh, from the uh, cable network into your home. You usually consume data and not produce data. So that's the reason why um, it's asymmetric when you subscribe uh, to uh, network service through a cable modem because most of the bandwidth is reserved for television. Right. And so television is already downstream and therefore any downstream data, including Internet traffic, is going to have much higher bandwidth. In addition, this television downstream data is shared. Right. Everybody on the cable network can get all possible channels. Now, I remember um, when I was much younger, there were lots of stories uh, about people getting these uh, bootleg uh, cable descramblers and they could get all the channels. Now, all the content is making its way downstream. So everyone's sharing the same information downstream. It's just that depending on what uh, products or what level of package you're subscribing to, you can only decode certain parts of it. Right. And so, you know, I remember when I used to have TV before my daughter was born, um, the uh, uh, sometimes Verizon Fios product, they would kind of, you know, turn on some program to try to hook you on it for two or three months and then turn it off. And you say, hey, what happened? Oh, you can subscribe if you want to. And so cable companies do that all the time. Uh, they'll turn on some premium content to try to hook you into wanting to purchase it because you'll miss it uh, in the future. But nonetheless, um, everyone gets all the data all the time, so it is shared, right? And because of that sharing on that backbone, on that infrastructure, um, also with data, that bandwidth is shared. So you'll notice um, if you have something like an Xfinity or some other, whether it's RCN or some other hybrid fiber coax uh, type internet access in a home environment, you notice that certain times of the day, 
uh, maybe during the dinner hour, um, it slows down tremendously. And that's because everyone is sharing bandwidth. And so if everyone in your neighborhood is maybe playing video games and some are you know, doing media streaming, some are watching Netflix, some are listening to music, there's more demand for this bandwidth than the available bandwidth, right? It is a zero sum game. So if there are more people demanding bandwidth, uh, then absolutely each person's share is going to be less. And that's why, you know, when you subscribe to these packages uh, on Xfinity, you'll notice it says up to 75 megabit per second, right? And that up to is sort of legal ease for them to get around the fact that it's shared. Um, whereas with something like Verizon Fios, uh, because it's fiber to the curb, everyone has guaranteed bandwidth. But if you subscribe to the business package uh, for Comcast, you actually have bandwidth guarantees. But that's why, in general, for residential cable modem packages, if you actually look at what they tell you, if you subscribe for a 75 megabit uh, upstream and downstream, they'll say up to 75 megabit, not 75 megabit. Okay? And what you pay for when you pay extra for the business version, there's no difference between the business version and uh, the residential version, except uh, what's called indemnification, right? That they give you certain guarantees and that's why they make you pay a little bit more. And one of those guarantees is on bandwidth and uptime. Okay. All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? And so the type of bandwidth you have uh, with hybrid fiber coax and, you know, granted this book was published or the seventh edition was published in 2017. So now uh, three years removed from that, uh, the numbers are a little bit different, but as of uh, 2017, the publishing of this book, hybrid fiber coax could give you about 30 megabit per second downstream and two megabit per second upstream. Now that has certainly changed, right? Uh, it's much faster than that now, even just three years from the publishing of the book. And they achieved that using compression and using signaling and uh, different ways of squeezing signal information, additional channel information into the same spectrum. Okay. All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So it's transmitted uh, TV and uh, data over different channels in this hybrid fiber coax. And this is what uh, cable head end uh, physically looks like. And you see these all over the place. Sometimes, especially uh, in these newer developments, uh, you see them dotted around the development. Uh, you also see them along uh, the roadway. Uh, I know I see them uh, around here, in different places. I can't remember exactly where, but I know I've seen them. Um, and these are communication devices. Uh, and this is where uh, the fiber optic strand comes in. And then what leaves is the coaxial cable. Now, you don't want to mess with these, right? Uh, even out of curiosity, because this is considered um, communications infrastructure. And uh, since 9-11, there are new terrorism laws in place. And one of the things they charge you with for terrorism laws, interference with critical uh, infrastructure, including communication infrastructure uh, like this. But if you're curious, sometimes you see uh, the trucks go out and you'll see the technicians come and they'll open these things up uh, and they'll just tinker with them, upgrading equipment and stuff like that. You can think of it as a computer closet. There's some electronic equipment uh, that's rack mounted and it slides in and out. And this uh, does some switching. It does a translation uh, between the fiber optic signal pulses of laser, converting that into electrical signals uh, along the coaxial cable. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. So that's a uh, cable head end. Let's continue on. Another type of access network is a home access network. Now, you absolutely have a network uh, in your home on the inside the house part uh, of a cable modem or a Verizon, a Verizon Fios uh, modem, right? So inside, uh, you have, on the side of the house rather, you have that device that accepts either coaxial cable, if you're looking at Xfinity, the HFC, hybrid fiber coax, or uh, the fiber optic uh, 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 box on the side of your house for Verizon, which offers what's called fiber uh, to the curb. And so on the other side, on the inside, you have a device, and that device um, uh, takes that signal, and it's either a cable modem, and you know this is sort of a nod to the age of the book, a DSL modem, or I'll throw in the fiber uh, modem, and that takes your raw signal, and it can split it into uh, the telev television signal uh, or the data signal, and then you have this thing uh, called your cable modem. Um, and so that modem, 
stands for modulator demodulator. And to modulate is to change something in frequency. And essentially what it does, uh, this physical medium has a certain range of frequencies uh, that it can support. And if you have a signal, you can shift its frequency. You preserve the signal information, the content, but you're shifting the frequency so that you can stuff multiple things in this one uh, communication medium. And so then you have that modulator demodulator or your modem. And now you have uh, a router, right? It can store and forward uh, packets or units of information uh, so they can ultimately get to your destination in the house, whether that's a packet that's inbound from the internet or it's outbound from one of these devices or it's between two devices in your home network. And so you can absolutely send uh, through this router uh, a message from one machine in your house to another machine in your house. And absolutely, you can have more than one router. Most homes don't need more than one, but there's absolutely nothing precluding you uh, precluding you uh, from having more than one router inside your house. You can go hog wild and set up whatever you want inside your house because it is a formal network that's now forwarding data to the internet uh, through that connection that you're leasing uh, from your service provider. So it also provides uh, a function called firewalling. Now, when we talk about the transport layer, we'll talk about something called ports, and I'll just mention the name now and not get into the details because it's not appropriate at this juncture, but a firewall allows you to block incoming traffic based on what the intended source or destination of that traffic is. And in network security, uh, a firewall allows you to, on a per-purpose basis, limit what sort of data can reach out of your network and what sort of data can come onto your network. And of course, on a personal level, it's really important that you understand network security, uh, especially as more and more people live more of their life online in digital form, uh, especially for things like banking and financial aid and all sorts of stuff. You want to be very, very careful about the traffic you allow onto your network and the traffic you allow off your network, right? Uh, identity theft is a real thing uh, and it's pretty damning and hard to recover from. So you have the firewall and then you also have something called NAT or network address translation, which we'll also get into in great detail when we talk about the link layer uh, towards like the two thirds, three quarters point in the semester. But at this juncture, we'll talk about NAT as a way to share um, your network addresses inside of your network. And when you get a cable modem, you only have one address that identifies you to the outside world. Now, of course, you have multiple devices, each of which needs its own address, and NAT is purpose for solving that problem. Uh, so this juncture, that's all we're going to say about it until we get into the details of NAT when we talk about uh, the link layer. So we have this device that does routing, it does firewalling, and it does network address translation. We also have wired Ethernet. Because uh, most home networks allow you to plug in uh, a Cat5, Category 5 cable or Category 6 cable, Ethernet cable, into a jack that you can physically use to have a wired connection uh, to your devices inside of the home network. Then we also have a wireless access point, and this wireless access point allows you to have wireless devices uh, in your house. And so all of these functions, the wireless access point, the wired access, the router, the firewall, the NAT, is typically uh, connected together in one device. And that's the one device that you get when you go to Best Buy and pay like $80, $125 or so forth. And so when you call it a router, it's not really a router. It's a device, network device, and it performs routing. It has a router inside. It has a NAT function inside. It has firewall capability. It's a wireless access point. All of those four things together uh, is that device that you buy in Best Buy for about $80 to $125. So it is not a router. A router has a very specific purpose and a very specific definition. It's just in casual parlance that we tend to call it routers. But if you actually read the box, it'll talk about switch, router, firewall, network address translation, things like port forwarding, which is a NAT function, and so forth. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So this is uh, the primary function of that box uh, that you'd buy from Best Buy. It provides a lot of functionality, uh, which we will talk about in detail uh, throughout the course uh, of this semester. 
Okay. And so lastly, let's talk about enterprise access networks. Uh, enterprise access network uh, takes a connection in from an internet service provider. And typically it's used by companies and universities only because uh, when you get bandwidth from an ISP for an enterprise network, they're not going to traffic in 75 megabit. They're going to traffic in hundreds of megabits to gigabits in, of bandwidth. Right? Um, does it require you being a company or university? Absolutely not. You as a home user could decide that you want to get a commercial line uh, from a service provider, right? It might cost you a few hundred to a few thousand a month, but if you have a reason to do that, let's say you know, you're an online gamer or maybe you have a, uh, uh, you know, you do day trading, stock trading or something, for whatever reason, it's all about having the money to pay for it. If you want to pay them for it, they will bring it into your house. So you could absolutely have, you know, um, a terabit, I don't know why you'd want it, but you could have a terabit of bandwidth coming to your house if you wanted to. Maybe you want to provide your community with internet service, right? You could absolutely do that if you chose to, okay? Uh, so there's nothing special about enterprise. It's just because they traffic in high bandwidth links, and if you think about it, um, an organization like DSU, you have 5,000 people in terms of the students, another five, 700 in terms of the staff, faculty, and everyone affiliated. Uh, so that's a lot of people potentially generating uh, bandwidth as well as consuming uh, uh, data, right? Consuming bandwidth. And so because of that, in aggregate, they usually traffic in a lot of bandwidth, and therefore uh, they would subscribe to these uh, bigger ISPs that provide you high-speed links. And so you have the institutional link, uh, from an ISP, and then typically these organizations in an enterprise uh, network, you have a number of routers and switches, these packet switching devices, to subdivide this bandwidth to serve the purposes of the various organizations that collectively uh, comprise that uh, business or school or enterprise. Okay, uh, so any questions about this? No? All right, so typically um, in these networks, you're going to have links. Now, 100 megabit was the standard, uh, but it's moving towards gigabit, gigabit switched Ethernet, and even uh, 10 gigabit links is very, very typical. Now, <laughs> unfortunately, in the past, the main link from the service provider for DSU, Cogent, uh, to the outside world was 500, um, was it five? It was 500, uh, it was really, really small. I think it was a gigabit or 500 megabit, and that was doubled. And then now I think we're, I, I can't remember what we are. Um, I'll have to do some research and find out what our main trunk line is, bless you. Um, and the reason why Rasomni got CIS Wi-Fi is because of the limitations with the main trunk. Essentially, um, uh, as a department or now division, we subscribe directly uh, to a business line through Comcast, which is why you realize faster bandwidth uh, in the department. Right, but uh, for the number of people on campus, and especially since the whole um, laptop and uh, tablet program has been instituted, if you think about it, um, every year 25% uh, new people come in with tablets, and this program has been going on for two years. So now half the student population is producing and consuming more bandwidth, so the network has to increase in bandwidth. And so Rasomni said, hey, well, we need, as a computer science department, uh, we need good bandwidth, so we're going to have our own private line, which is what CIS Wi-Fi is. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? So make sure to thank Uncle Rasomni, so to speak. All right. Yes. Yes, it's a business link. And so you can imagine if I drew another link uh, from external, and it goes directly to computer science. And that's what, uh, that's what we did. Any other questions? Which is why it's so fast. If you go to DSU Wireless or DSU Student, it's slower, right? And that's why it's faster, because we have our own uh, serving of bandwidth. Okay. Any other questions? No? All right. So, um, wireless access network. Now, wireless access network is what you're using on your laptops. You have a wireless access point, and in each laptop is an antenna, and that antenna usually runs along the side of your monitor, sometimes it's on your motherboard, and it's talking to an access point, and these access points are somewhere above the raised ceiling uh, throughout, the, throughout the building. Uh, and they all contend for bandwidth because they're broadcasting, kind of like a walkie-talkie, right? Uh, they all maintain a broadcast radius so that signal can reach a certain distance around your laptop, and that signal makes its way to the antenna 
uh, for the access point and engages in a communication. Now, of course, when you send out a wireless signal, something can happen. A big bag of water, known as a person, can walk by the antenna. And uh, radio frequency signal does not propagate or move the environment well when it comes in contact with water, right? And so you can have all sorts of interference in addition to people walking by the antenna. Um, you'll notice these cinder blocks are made out of concrete. Uh, so radio frequency does not propagate well through stone and through concrete because of the metal content inside of it. And so you'll find sometimes certain sections of the building, as you go further and further away uh, from the antenna for the physical access point, that signal gets weaker and weaker and weaker and can no longer propagate through all of these wonderful concrete cinder blocks. So you'll find in certain pockets of the building uh, that your speed drops down precipitously, right? And that's why. Um, it propagates well through wood, uh, through things like these uh, ceiling panels, but not well through metal and not well uh, through concrete and stone, right? Uh, so you're all broadcasting and not only does this data uh, travel, but it also bounces off of objects in the environment as well. And so you're gonna get a lot of reflections. And so the reflections as well as the materials, as well uh, as uh, the signal strength decreasing as you go further away, this all contributes to noise in the environment. And so this noise in the environment takes away from the signal. And because it takes away from the signal, what you see is a lessened ability to pass data back and forth, which is why in some conditions, you'll find your wireless does not give you as good bandwidth as say wired. And wired always gives you better bandwidth than wireless. So if you wanna download something particularly big, that's gonna take some time, you're better off plugging in uh, to an ethernet jack than using wireless. Or if you know where the access point is, you want to sit closer to the access point because it doesn't have to travel as far and you get a much stronger signal strength. You ever find when you're driving, let's say you take a road trip, right? Sometimes you use your cell phone, it gets really, really hot, right? And the reason for that is that the cell phone, if it's far from a cell tower or beyond a certain distance, it'll sense that the signal strength is decreasing and it'll boost the power to the antenna uh, in effort to get good connection with that cell tower. And a consequence of boosting that power is to dissipate some of that energy as heat, right? If you increase current through a wire, it's gonna heat up and that's why your cell phone heats up when you're far away from a cell tower, right? And so this idea of signal strength and noise is really an important thing and when people develop new wireless technologies, what they're doing is looking at different ways of compressing the data, different ways of coding the data, uh, different ways of propagating the data to try to decrease the amount of noise uh, and increase the amount of signal. Because if you can increase uh, the signal to noise ratio, uh, you can get uh, greater bandwidth, okay? And so wireless LANs are intended for transmitting data hundreds of feet. Now, when you look at a typical wireless router, you know, let's say 300 feet or 500 feet, that's in ideal conditions in a noise-free environment. And of course you buy one and you bring it home and you notice in some parts of the house, in a wooden house, it's not that good, right? Uh, that's ideal conditions that they're talking about. So they'll stay in a lab and everything's line of sight and they'll measure the signal strength and say, okay, we can maintain a connection with one bar uh, 500 feet away. Now, of course, uh, no particular installation uh, gives you ideal conditions. So your results will vary uh, when you have Wi-Fi uh, at home. And so the standard 802.11 B, G, or N uh, for Wi-Fi has different theoretical bandwidths of 11 megabit uh, per second, 54, and 450 megabit per second. Now, again, that is ideal conditions. Your results will vary, okay? Uh, and so for wide area, which is for the cell phone network, these signals are intended uh, to operate maybe like you know miles uh, at a time. And so this is also not perfect. You need more than one connection to a cell tower to maintain uh, a cell phone signal, both for the data as well as the voice. And you know this varies between one and 10 megabit. Now the onset of 5G or five generation uh, will make that bandwidth, uh, it's been published theoretically one gigabit up to five gigabit. 
Uh, and if you think about what that means, if you have gigabit uh, per second bandwidth in wireless, now you can do all sorts of applications uh, real time from a mobile device, including an automobile. A lot of exciting stuff as well as sensors. Now, in the early days of cell phone, a cell phone was nothing more, uh, and it's called a cell phone because it was initially something called cellular radio. Right? You had a tower, and that cellular radio was nothing more than a glorified walkie-talkie. Right? And this glorified walkie-talkie looked like a shaving bag. Right? It was huge, and you had a handset. It's almost like someone took a house landline, attached a big battery to it, which is essentially what they did, a big antenna, and then you carried it around like a laptop in a laptop case. That's what early cell phones looked like. And that was so-called 1G. So then uh, Jesse Russell came along, uh, and I encourage you to watch the video. Um, on your own time, uh, not now. Uh, he came along and he had a background in digital signal processing. And initially, cell phones were called car phones, right? Now, of course, you know, they say don't, don't sell and drive, distract the driving, all that stuff. But the idea was that you'd keep this cell phone, this glorified walkie-talkie, um, in your car. Uh, why? Because your car has a big battery. And if the cell phone battery didn't work, you could plug it into the cigarette jack and you could get extra power. Now, of course, um, this division was losing a lot of money, right? And they wanted to see how can we increase this money? But the problem was that people weren't in their cars um, a lot. They just were in their cars to drive, not to to stay a long amount of time. But initially it was called a car phone. And I remember the first car phone I ever saw, it was like, wow, right? You had to be very money to have a car phone, right? And so what um, Mr. Russell did, he came along and he said, I had a, a, a background in digital signal processing. And digital signal processing um, is a discipline. It has its own branch of math and all sorts of stuff with how you take an analog signal, right? Something that's electricity and convert it into something that's digital, something that can be understood uh, by a computer. And in doing so, he was able to increase the amount of data you could transmit over wire. And if you think about data over wire, think about what you can transfer over uh, a phone connection, right? Phone was initially purposed was transmitting voice. And when you had modems, you could only get kilobit. I remember I had a, uh, a 128 kilobit modem and I thought I was living, you know, living large, right? Um, because now I could do email from home instead of having to do it at work. Right. Um, and you didn't really have video, but you had uh, audio that you could send. And uh, consequently, one of the big uh, developments was radio streaming. And if you are familiar with Mark Cuban, how Mark Cuban became a billionaire is he started the first uh, uh, MP3 uh, uh, download streaming site. It was called MP3.com, which was bought by Yahoo for a couple billion dollars. Um, and uh, it became Yahoo Music, and that's how Mark Cuban became a billionaire because he created the first online MP3 uh, streaming site. But nonetheless, history uh, aside, so what Jesse Russell did is he said, let's digitize this, turn it from analog signal to digital signal, and in doing so, the cellular radio became digital cellular radio, and now you could have individuals walking around with a phone instead of it being tied to the automobile. And so he was the inventor of the modern digital cell phone, which was called, you could call it 2G, which is 2G, right? So 1G was a glorified walkie-talkie, 2G was a digital version, and now current versions after that, 3G and 4G, are just different ways of encoding that digital signal to get more bandwidth along the same physical medium, okay? And of course, 5G is uh, really hot. It's gonna be rolled out uh, in, uh, in, a, in a large way, in a big way uh, throughout 2020 and beyond, okay? So if you were, uh, if I were starting out like you, you know, just graduating, and now we're gonna get into wireless communication, um, it's a good time to get involved in wireless communication if that interests you uh, because, uh, we're just getting started with 5G. Okay, any questions about this? No? <clears throat> so let's take a look at this idea of physically how data is sent uh, along the wire. I talked more kind of high level about this idea of a packet. And I said a packet uh, is the unit of transfer of data across some physical medium. And so a packet is nothing more than taking the data you have in your application and chopping it up into pieces. And the reason why it's chopped up into pieces is because it's easier to transmit, but also when you standardize on the size of something, now you can make things very, very fast. Now, packet size right now is 4096 bytes, uh, but that could certainly change as IP version 6 and 5G uh, becomes more pervasive. And so the application 
could be Google Maps, it could be uh, video conference, what have you, uh, your application on your behalf is taking your data and chopping it up into standard sized pieces called packets. Now, of course, not only does it contain the data itself, it also adds some other important information, uh, bookkeeping and addressing, that it needs in order to send that unit of data across the wire between the sender and receiver endpoints, making its way across the route infrastructure along the way. And so these smaller chunks of data that are standard size are called packets. And in the computations uh, for packets, at least in this textbook, the packet size is uh, used a variable L. So a packet it has length L many bits, and these packets are sent into the access network at a particular rate uh, connoted by R, which is the transmission rate. And this transmission rate talks about uh, the speed at which these ones and zeros, the bits of that data, are encoded and transmitted into the network. So imagine if every second you could read 100 bits. Right, And so um, if you're dealing with frequencies of pulses of laser light in the fiber, maybe you have one frequency representing a zero bit and another frequency representing a one bit. If you were dealing, say, if you know Morse code, a dit and a da, right, each tone represents a different bit value. And you're just uh, sending these bits as you read those ones and zeros for that packet's worth of data. And so that transmission rate describes the rate at which you encode this data uh, for propagation down the wire, sending across the wire. And so every communication link, whether you're a hybrid fiber coax, whether you're wireless, whether you're a fiber optic strand, every type of communication link uh, has a bandwidth, has a capacity. Uh, and that capacity is different because the means by which this data goes down this physical link is different. Now, a fiber optic strand, it's expensive, right? Because you need a special type of glass, silicon, uh, in a crystalline form, and then you have to make, into, make it into a thin strand and make sure it's done consistently. And then you get a laser and you pulse that laser light on one end of the glass strand and it comes out on the other end. And so the rate at which you pulse it can tell you uh, to encode a zero bit or a one bit. Now, of course, that's expensive, but the beautiful part about that is that that laser light being pulsed doesn't have very much interference. Uh, it bends inside of this glass and never leaves the glass. And moreover, it's covered with some sheathing. And so that light never gets polluted, if you will, other sources of light changing the value of those pulses of laser. And so for that reason, it's very high speed and there's very little interference. And so it's expensive, but you can push a lot of data down a fiber um, very, very fast, right? And so other communication mediums uh, like copper wire, well, it works well, but copper wire is susceptible to interference, right? Um, if you take a conductor, any metal, or copper wire, uh, it's a metal, or steel, or anything that can conduct electricity. And if you take a magnetic field and move that magnetic field anywhere near that wire, that magnetic field is going to attract the electrons in that wire. And the result is it's going to change the electrical signal, right? And so it's called flux cutting electromotive force. So you take a magnet and you move it, it's going to wiggle those electrons and the result of which is changing the voltage. Now, of course, if you're encoding a one bit, which is five volts on a wire and a copper wire, and you change those electrons and are able to drop that five volts down to maybe uh, two and a half volts, now that one bit representation is now changed to a zero bit. And that's where you get interference. Has anyone ever used a tube TV, like a regular air channel TV? No? You're all too young. All right. I figured, all right, <laughs> a regular tube TV. Well, you know how some devices, if you turn on a hairdryer nearby, all of a sudden you see those wavy lines? What that is, is that's interference. That hairdryer has a motor, and that motor is spinning very fast, and it's high voltage. And when you spin high voltage, change its axis of, orient of polarization uh, very quickly, you're taking, it's a big electromagnet, and it's now taking the magnetic field and changing it, right? And that's inducing a current which is interfering with the electrons in your TV, right? Uh, so that's what interference looks like. So anytime you have metal and, and a magnet somewhere, whether it's an electromagnet or a permanent magnet, and you move that magnetic field or change it, it'll induce a current or change the, uh, the, the voltage in that uh, conductor, right? And so for that reason, 
uh, copper wire as a conductor, like category five cable, these blue cables you see for network, they're more susceptible to interference than the fiber optic strand. And the consequence of that is that they are lower bandwidth. And the reason why increased noise and interference leads to lower bandwidth is because underneath the covers, the signaling needs to do more detection and is spending more time recovering from errors than it is just sending data. And so the end result is uh, it's lower bandwidth. And then wireless is even worse because at least the copper wire, it's a guided pathway, but wireless is just out in the airwaves. So anybody who can generate electromagnetic signal in the air can interfere with your device. And in fact, um, don't do this because you get yourself into some serious trouble, but there are devices you can buy on eBay um, where, you know, let's say you go on a bus, go in an airport, it has a battery, you turn it on, put it in your book bag and just sit there and it'll block all cell phone communication. It is highly illegal to do that, right? Uh, and that all it's doing, it's just sending out electromagnetic signals at the right frequency, the same frequencies that the cell phones are using, and now it just washes all that out. It's almost like you're trying to have a conversation and you have 10 people just saying random stuff while you're trying to have a conversation. You can't hear what the signal is because all that other traffic is washing it out, okay? All that other signal is washing it out. Okay, and so for that reason, wireless has a lot of interference and just by how wireless operates, you have reflections, you have things like cinder block, you have people walking by, uh, which are not very good propagators of wireless signal, and all of that contributes uh, to the lower bandwidth of wireless. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions about this? So, yes. Mm. And so the packet sniffer participates in the network and it reads this packet information and is programmed with uh, all the different uh, values that the fields in the packet can take on and it just writes or draws on the screen uh, what it means, right? So a packet sniffer is nothing special. It's just a participant in the network that has some uh, code in there and some graphics to show you, the human, what the contents of this uh, packet information is, okay? All right, any other questions? No, all right. So we have, uh, a packet and we want to send this packet and one measure that's important to know is the transmission delay how long it takes to actually put this packet uh, on the wire right so we take the size of the packet l in bits and it's going to be really important going forward to be able to keep track of the units here so we have l the size of the packet in bits uh, and then we have r which is in units bits per second that's the rate uh, which it gets encoded and transmitted into uh, the link. And so L over R, right, we have bits divided by bits over seconds. So the bits cancel, uh, there's one in the numerator, one in the denominator, and it's one over seconds in the denominator. So that seconds becomes seconds in the numerator and the resulting unit is in seconds, right? And so L over R is unit second and it's the amount of time it takes to transmit an L bit sized packet into a link whose transmission rate is R bits per second. Does that make sense? Any questions? And so why would you want to know that? Well, suppose you're designing a network and you want a certain end-to-end -end throughput uh, in your network. Well, it's important to know the characteristics of all of the links from one path uh, the, along the path from one host uh, to the other host from the source to the destination. And now if you know what the transmission delay is, you can now determine what the end-to-end -end performance will be for any network application. So for example, this is important, especially in today's era of network uh, applications. Uh, so if you were a vendor, like let's say Netflix, um, let's say, you know, you're, uh, on Fios, or no, on a Fios, you're on uh, Xfinity, and it's like, you know, six o'clock, and you're all sophisticated computer science and IT students, but let's say you're not a uh, computer science or IT, you know, you're just someone who's purely a consumer of, uh, of uh, content, not knowing at all about the underlying technology. And so it's six o'clock, and a lot of people uh, on, in your neighborhood are, you know, doing video streaming, and you pull up Netflix and you, uh, you set, you're set to watch a movie. Now, all of a sudden, that movie kind of slows down, it pauses, it buffers, it pauses. Who are you going to blame? You're going to blame Netflix. And Netflix's product stinks. This is horrible. I'm not going to, I'm going to cancel my subscription. This is horrible. It always does this, right? 
And really, the problem is that uh, the transmission along that link between, say, the cable head end and your home is slow, right? And so purveyors of services are really, really, really concerned about what transmission rates are, and they actually um, pay uh, service providers uh, for preferred treatment of their packets, right? Uh, because you don't blame Netflix, you don't blame uh, Xfinity, you blame Netflix, unless you're sophisticated uh, like yourselves, right? Okay, any questions about this? So these measurements are really important, and this is the so-called transmission delay, the amount of time it takes to send a single packet of data across a link. Now, of course, to encode your message, it takes more than one packet, right? And so the slower the transmission uh, uh, performance of the link, the bandwidth of the link, the slower it is going to be to trans, uh, transfer this message across the wire. So let's take a look at the physical media. Uh, there are different types of physical media. That's the actual hardware itself uh, for transmitting uh, information from one entity, from one component to the next. And so a bit uh, propagates. It's uh, between a transmitter and receiver. And a bit is the basic unit of transfer in digital systems. It can be a one or a zero. How you represent that one or zero is different depending on the physical link. If it's a copper wire, it's a five volts is one, and zero volts is a zero. Um, if it's a uh, laser, um, it's a, if it's fiber optic strand, it's one of two different frequencies of pulses of laser light. Um, so a bit propagates between the transmitter and receiver, and when you transmit information, you first transmit the first bit, whether it's a one or a zero, the second bit, then the third bit, and the fourth bit. Once it's received at the receiver, it's stored somewhere in memory, and then the next bit is transferred. That's how transmission happens. And so the physical link is what lies between the transmitter and receiver, and so-called guided media are things or types of transmission media where the signal stays in the medium itself. So if you think about fiber optic strand, that laser pulse stays in the fiber optic strand. If you think about electricity, that electricity value, that voltage, that current, those electrons, it stays on the wire. Uh, conversely, you have unguided media. Unguided media, it does not stay in the medium. If you think about the antennas uh, on your laptops for wireless communication, this thing kind of goes out into the environment in all directions. Right. So, you know, you put your cell phone to your head. It doesn't care that your brain is right there on the other side of the cell phone. Right. Uh, so in guided media, signals propagate in a solid uh, substance, whether it's co uh, copper, fiber or coaxial cable. Unguided media, they propagate freely in the environment like a wireless signal. And so twisted pair, this is an example of a twisted pair. And the reason that the twisted pair in copper wire is twisted, it has to do with something called a toroid, right? If you have a moving electrical signal that can generate electrical field, right? And so when you twist it, these electrical fields cancel one another and it, that has the effect of reducing interference, right? And so in a network cable just like these, if I were to cut it, which I wouldn't, um, you'd see uh, twisted pairs. Uh, in there uh, of wires. Okay, uh, so um, Ethernet uh, category five or cat five cable gets you about 100 megabits of bandwidth and then cat six cable category six gets you up to about 10 gigabit. Now when you buy Ethernet cable, um, typically in an environment like this, uh, you could buy like a cable at Best Buy for six feet and pay a lot of money for it. Or typically it's the case that you buy a spool of a thousand yards and then you would cut it uh, to suit your purposes and then add the hardware to terminate it yourself. And that's how it's done uh, for real, okay? So what you're paying for when you buy this CAT6 cable is the speed rating. And the speed rating talks about the quality of the materials and the manufacturing, which gives you this higher bandwidth capability for CAT6 versus CAT5. So if you buy network cable and you got a really good deal, you wanna make sure you check the, the, the spec on bandwidth because it would stink to spend a lot of money on a, on a high speed router only to run uh, slow bandwidth uh, cabling out of it, right? You wanna consider all of the components if you wanna get good end-to-end -end performance, the links as well as the components attached to those links, okay? So you could have a really fast computer, a really high speed router, uh, but if you only have 100 megabit CAT5 cable, you're never gonna get more than 100 megabit. Right. Um, so you want to make sure that you understand uh, the specifications associated with all the components along the path between the source and the destination endpoints for any communication. All right. Questions? Does that make sense? Yes. 
Pardon? Yeah, that's kind of, yeah, that, that's there too. It's like one, one gigabit. Um, so yes, there are all sorts of specs uh, based on the rating and the quality, uh, but I didn't mention all of them. Uh, but yes, you're absolutely right. This Cat 5e, there's all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay. So coax, uh, coaxial cable, which I talked about before, is used in hybrid fiber coax. It's uh, more high bandwidth than twisted pair uh, because of the relationship between the core in the middle and that copper sheathing. Uh, it's bi-directional communication. Uh, it is also guided media. Um, fiber optic cable is the highest bandwidth. You can get hundreds of gigabit transmission rate uh, just by changing uh, the way you pulse the laser. Now, of course, when you pulse the laser, you have to have hardware at the endpoints that generate the laser pulses and that read the laser pulses. And that's what the difference is when you have a higher bandwidth fiber optic strand versus a lower one. And again, there's less interference and it's not uh, susceptible to electromagnetic interference. So if you go up to a fiber optic cable and you turn on a hairdryer nearby it, it's not going to generate interference, but the same is not true with the twisted pair Cat5 or Cat6 cable. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Let me check the time. I need to still buy a watch. I don't want to spend the money on an iWatch. But anyways, um, but nonetheless... But it's all good for you if you have an eye watch. I need to keep my watches for like 12, 10 or 12 years. Mine broke after 15 years, so I need to get a new one. Um, anyways, so low error rate with a fiber optic cable. And physical media, another one is uh, radio, right? Now, when I say radio, I don't mean like, you know, you buy a radio at the store and you can listen to music. Um, when, I, when I say radio, I mean devices that produce or consume electromagnetic energy in the environment. That's exactly how a radio for music works. Uh, but in this case, the radio is used to send and receive data, like a walkie-talkie. And there is a radio inside of your laptop uh, for the purpose of doing wireless uh, communication. And so there's no physical wire. It's bidirectional. And this uh, electromagnetic uh, information or energy propagates in the environment. And of course, in the environment, there are objects in the environment uh, that are a source of interference for it. And this is the lowest bandwidth of all the link types uh, that we've been talking about. Now, satellite is nothing more than a fancy radio. It's a really nice radio, really good radio that can go over very far distances. And it's also on a craft that sits in orbit. Uh, above the Earth, right? Uh, and so these satellites are another type of radio, if you will. Uh, they're high frequency, usually um, uh, gigahertz and no, terahertz uh, frequencies, um, and it's very expensive to use satellite. Now, of course, you know if you've ever seen these satellite phones, they're a little bit bigger, and the antennas like huge. Uh, these things can uh, basically they're like cell phones that talk directly to satellite. They're very expensive, but there's also a delay because this energy has to propagate up into low Earth orbit and then back down somewhere else on the Earth. Now, there's a lot, not a lot of interference when you're going up in the sky somewhere and back down somewhere else. And so these things can go um, very long distances uh, and get decent uh, bandwidth, um, but they're not very fast per se. Uh, they do the job, but they're also very expensive. And so you can get satellite-based internet service. A lot of people in remote... Uh, I shouldn't say remote, in underserved rural areas, uh, typically pay the extra it takes to get satellite internet service. You can get it for about one or two hundred dollars a month. It's a little more expensive than something like uh, Xfinity or um, Fios. Uh, but if you want internet and you want to enjoy the beautiful uh, scenery of a rural area that doesn't have much internet service, uh, you're going to have to go the route of satellite. Okay. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? And so the delays are longer because to transmit, you have to code it differently, but you can still get about 45 megabit per second on the high side, kilobits on the low side. Okay, so you have to make those trade-offs. Okay. So let's, uh, let me do a time check. I think I'll introduce the next module. We have 15 more minutes. Let's look a little bit at the network core and talk in more detail about the things that impact uh, this uh, switching. And so 
The network core uh, in this diagram, we talked about the access networks. And the access networks, they are networks, and it's where these edge devices or these end systems or hosts uh, attach to the, to the internet. We talked about enterprise networks, home networks, we talked about uh, wireless networks. Uh, so now we're gonna move our way to the interior and talk about the sort of things that ISPs uh, would do. And so a service provider, they manage a bunch of devices, these packet switches. And again, to refresh your memory, these packet switches are so-called store and forward devices. They accept these standard units of information, these packets, uh, they analyze them, and then based on their analysis, the information contained therein, they send them out one of some number of links. And of course, if one forwards it to another, forwards it to another, eventually that packet makes its way from one source, ultimately to some destination on the other edge of the network. And so these service providers, this is called the network core, and they sometimes call it a, a switching fabric because if you have enough of these edges, it looks like the threads on a sweater, looks like fabric. And so this network core has a switching fabric and these hosts break the application layer uh, packets into um, messages or data into packets and they forward them from one router to the next and in aggregate these forwarding actions um, uh, propagate this packet to the destination. And so each packet, when it's transmitted, it has full link capacity of that particular link because that link uh, accommodates one bit at a time. And so when a particular bit is being transmitted, uh, you have the full ability uh, to carry this energy along that wire or along the wireless or along that fiber. And so you have full use of this bandwidth and it takes L over R many seconds to transmit or to push out this packet from uh, one uh, host uh, to another uh, component on the network. And so if you look at this diagram, you look at the head of line packet, right? Because if you're gonna chop this message up into packets and think about like an image, you take a block of image, a block of image, a block of image, and each block might fill a packet. Now, they're gonna line up because they're each gonna wait their turn uh, to be transmitted. And of course, on the receiver side, when it gets a packet, the first packet, the second packet, the third packet, its job is to reconstruct the original message, each packet's worth of information at a time. So when the head of line packet is being transmitted, you'll notice here, this kind of box talks about the actual packet itself that's being transmitted, and you can see half of it has been transmitted, right? And so that packet, you can think of as kind of straddling the two endpoints. Part of it is here, and the other part is here, and it's being sent across one packet, one bit rather, at a time, right? And once that last bit on this side of the wire has been transmitted, now the whole thing is here. Once the entire thing is at the other endpoint along that uh, link, then it's considered as fully transmitted, okay? And that takes time, and that time is called the transmission time. And so uh, a router, uh, a packet switch, is called a store and forward device, because in order to receive it, you have to store it uh, until it's fully contained. And then to send it across, well, what's gonna happen once it's fully received at this packet switch, it's gonna now start sending it out across the wire one bit at a time, right? And so for this reason, a packet switch is called a store and forward device because it stores a packet and it forwards it out based on some analysis. And so here, if we were going to consider the delay for transmission, uh, from the computer on the left, store and forward by the router or the packet switch in the middle to the host on the right. Let's assume for the sake of example that the link inbound to the packet switch uh, transmits at R bits per second and the link outbound from the packet switch to the destination also transmits at R bits per second. So we have L many bits for the packets. It takes L over R seconds to get from the source to the packet switch and then another L over R seconds to get from the packet switch to the destination. So you have two times that L over R, or two L over R is the calculation for the number of seconds it takes to go so-called two hops, the first hop, the second hop from the source to the destination. So end to end for this example, to send this packet, one packet of information from source to destination, it takes two L over R seconds uh, in order just to transmit it. Does that make sense? And so for every single packet, 2L over R, 2L over R, 2L over R. So here we have three such packets. The first one, 
takes 2L over R. Next one takes 2L over R. Next one takes 2L over R. Now, I'm simplifying it uh, because that's not what really happens in reality, right? Uh, because what happens in reality is this router stores, or this packet switch, stores more than one packet. So when the first packet that's received gets transmitted along the second link, the next one's coming in, the next one's coming in, and this router has some memory that it can use to store multiple packets. And when you buy a router, one of the things you're paying for, especially for the high-speed routers, you're paying for the amount of performance for that router to be able to analyze packets, as well as the amount of memory the router has, specialized memory. It's not like buying RAM at Best Buy. Um, specialized RAM for storing more or buffering more packets at the router, right, or at the packet switch. Okay, so it takes 2L over R uh, delay uh, to get a packet two hops in this example from the source uh, to the destination. And so you could plug in some numbers. Let's say L is 7.5 megabit. Now, nomenclature, uh, let's take a little pause here. When you say megabit, right, that's bit uh, with a small b. But if you say mega MB, where B is capitalized, that's megabyte, right? So megabit is a uh, million bits. Megabyte with a capital B is a uh, million bytes, where a byte is eight bits. That's really, really important to remember. Because if you're solving a problem and you said eight megabytes per second, right? That's um, eight million times eight bits per second, okay? So please pay attention to whether the B is capitalized or lowercase. Capital B means byte, uh, lowercase b means bit, okay? All right, any questions about this? So with these numbers, we have 7.5 megabit megabits uh, if the packet size uh, was 7.5 megabits, and if the transmission rate of each link is 1.5 megabits per second, that means for one hop or one length of the link, uh, the delay is going to be five seconds because 7.5 megabits divided by 1.5 megabits per second is five seconds, right? So total for two hops, it's going to take five seconds across this link and another five seconds across that link for a total end to end of 10 seconds for a single packet. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? Okay. And so it'll be really important uh, with the first homework that we're going to have. Uh, to be able to do these calculations. And the key is to pay attention to the units, both whether it's capital B or lowercase b, uh, bit or byte, um, as well as how many hops your packet will traverse uh, across packet switches to get from the source uh, to the destination endpoint. Okay, any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay, so next time what we'll pick up is we'll look at other forms of, of delay, right? So the transmission delay is just one of four different sources of delay that can impact the end-to-end -end throughput between a source and a destination. Because at the end of the day, as an application writer like Netflix, you care about the experience to get from that content from the server in the data center to somebody's screen on their laptop, desktop, or Roku, or what have you. Right? That's what you care about, the end-to-end -end performance. So as far as the switching fabric is concerned, you care about end-to-end. -end. And there are multiple sources of delay, one of which is the transmission. Next time when we pick up, we're going to talk about the queuing delay and also loss. And that's related to the rate at which packets come into the router. If packets come into the router faster than the router can push them out, they get stored. Now that storage is finite, what happens when that storage fills up, okay? So we'll pick back up with that on Monday. I don't want to build, uh, talk about a new module in just five more minutes that are left. So we'll end five minutes early, and I will see you all on Tuesday, rather. Uh, Monday is the MLK holiday, uh, so please enjoy, and uh, I will see you on Tuesday.